You're listening to an Anderson Entertainment production. This episode, we're feeling snackish in Fab Facts. This week's randomizer could be so good for you. Attention all sections Alpha, Space 1999, The Vault author Chris Bentley is here. That's all coming up in Pod 224 of the Jerry Anderson Podcast. Let's get started. Let's go. Spectrum is green. The Jerry Anderson Podcast with Jamie Anderson and Richard James. Richard James, well, hello. Hello for pod 224. You see, I, I remember when it was pod 24, let alone 200 later. Uh, yes. Wow. You're, you're right. In fact, I was talking to a, a podcast master today. Oh, yeah. Chris Dale. Uh, yeah, a different one, in fact. Oh, right. And um, uh, yes, he was amazed by the fact that we've done that many podcasts week after week yeah. after week after week. I should yeah. say that 224 times. Anyway, yes, I, I yes. think actually this is the... This is the closest proximity ever, other than a live, that we've done to when the podcast is actually released in terms of recording, ah, isn't it? Ah, yes, I suppose it could be. Yes, it's, it's that's quite, true. It's quite close to re- release time now, oh, but we've, it's, we've been yeah. very busy boys, haven't we? We have uh, well, ill and busy. Yes, Ill in and my then case. Busy. Let's let's yes. not ponder on that no, too no. much. No, uh, I've been to that already. Uh, so uh, the sickly child over there is Richard James. <laughs> no, I'm better now. Honestly, I'm better. <laughs> okay. Uh, and the hale and hearty fellow over there is Jamie Anderson. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. And uh, later yeah. on, we'll also be joined by the randomizer Chris Dale, ah, who will yes. be here with his randomizer. Uh, who knows how. Hey. His button will be pressed. Who yeah, will press it? Who knows? Who or knows? how that will be done, because that yeah. is revealed in the randomizer, the randomizer, as I've been admonished about this week, as you may well, well read something later on. I don't know. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, but he'll be here later on. Uh, between now and then, there's loads of other stuff, isn't there, Richard James? Such as... Yes. Yes. Oh, oh, crikey, you put me on the spot now. Uh, right, let's think. Okay, we've got Fab Facts coming up in just a moment. Yes. Uh, which is everybody's favourite section of the podcast, Correct. of course. Uh, actually, uh, quite a few people do seem to enjoy it, don't they? I know. I e- even Keith Gooch, who comments every week and is extremely <laughs> judgmental on my fab factory. Uh, but thankfully, yes. the last few weeks, he's actually said, well, it's quite interesting. Yeah. yeah, well, that's good news. Yeah. Uh, then we've got some news uh, from the Jerry Addison universe, because there's always something new happening, as we know. Uh, so we'll be reporting on a few stories. There. It's a busy week. Uh, we've... Is it? Cool, oh, it really good. is. You know it Great. is. You've got stuff to do yes, this I'm... week. That's true. Uh, we've got an interview with Chris Bentley, uh, author of Space 1999, The Vault. I'm assuming this is the first of two or three, Jamie, or just the one? It's the first of... Drumroll, please. Mm. Go on. Four parts. You're, what? Really? <laughs> I know. Well, Chris no, Chris good. has got such a long history in the world of Anderson yep. that we just chatted and chatted and chatted, and he was fascinating and it was brilliant and I loved it, and so we kept going. Um, Brilliant. So, yes, I mean, Chris is not just the author of The Vault. He's done no. loads of other vaults and loads of other books. Mm-hmm. Um, he knew Dad. He remembered uh, the toilet window in the house. Um, right, that's quite yeah. specific. Uh, well, you will have to listen in to him, although he slightly oh, misremembers okay. where it was, but still, he does remember <laughs> correctly a toilet window. And many more right. interesting Jerry Anderson facts beyond that. Well, you say many more. <laughs> I hope they'll be more interesting than that. <laughs> Sorry, many more interesting than that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's good. Uh, excellent. Uh, and then, of course, as Jamie's mentioned, we've got Chris Dale later on with his amazing randomizer. And in between, above, beyond, and below all that, We've been hearing from our lovely Podstrons. Our beautiful listeners, that's you. You've been emailing us in uh, at podcast at jerryanderson.com. You've been commenting on our Facebook page. That's over at facebook.com forward slash groups forward slash Podstrons. So I suppose it's a group and not a page, isn't it? <laughs> it is yeah. a group, yes. Yeah, yeah. Very yeah. different. Uh, and you've been tweeting us as well over on Twitter, hashtagging us, Jerry Anderson Podcast, tagging me, Richard Ed James, him over there, I'm Jamie Anderson, and him joining us later, Chris Dalek. All yes. of that's gum. All of that. There's loads. And also, I don't know if you've noticed, but if we've done this right, and I don't know if we have done it right yet, but if we have done it right, then in your podcast player of choice, 
yeah. which does not include YouTube because you naughty people on YouTube, you should be listening through a mm. podcast app, really. Yeah, so yeah. if you are in a podcast app, you'll notice we've got a change of art for the Jerry Anson oh. podcast. For the first time in 224 <gasps> pods, we've got yes. a brand new cover image featuring yes. three idiots. Oh, right, okay. By which I mean you, me, and Chris Dale. (laughs) Well, very dare you. We wanted to bring the human side to the podcast so you you don't think it's just, you know, noises from Thunderbird 2 and and, uh, an Eagle Transporter. It's three other human sources of hot air instead. That's Uh, true. So here we are. We hope you like it. Do let us know. Email us podcast at jerryanderson.com or uh, do the hashtag thing on Twitter. Hashtag Mm. jerryandersonpodcast. And please judge our art. Yes, judge away. Mm. Oof, right you've redecorated i don't like it <laughs> I, uh, if uh, yes there'll be somebody who says that I've, of i can imagine two of two of our lovely podstrons who might say exactly that <laughs> so standing by for that thing anyway Excellent. oh goodness yeah. me should we have a fab fact i'm feeling i need a fab fact oh well go on go and get one then okay here comes a fab okay here comes a fab fact <laughs> oh there it is now time for this week's fab facts well, there we go. From biting my own face, which is what happened just then. Uh, yes, that was a thing. <laughs> to a fab fact. I've got to book a fab fact. biting someone else's. Uh, that's true. Uh, funnily enough, Eric the dog has just come in and he uh, oh. also agrees that he, no face Good. biting is allowed. Um, so a f- book of fab facts is in front of me. It's a giant mm-hmm. tome of many facts, most of which are fab. And I'm going to flick through the book. Richard will shout fab, which will stop me flicking at a random location. And I shall read you a fact Henceforth, from the page where Richard has arrested my flicking. What? Okay, <laughs> I think I understand. <laughs> I don't. Here we go. Uh, fab. Oh, gosh, I banged yeah. into the mic then as well. Oh, it's all going on, isn't it? Ah, gosh, right. Now, just calm down, Jamie. Calm down. Well, no, I'm quite excited about this. Calm. <laughs> I'm a bit overtired, but uh, <laughs> here we go. Right. Yeah. Richard James, you like these? Yes. I'm bringing you a hypothetical scenario. Oh, yeah, I'm a big fan of the old hypotheticals. Good. Okay, right, well, uh, picture this. You've got Mm. some time off. Uh, Right, I have, yes. (laughs) You're at home. It's very difficult for you to picture so far, I'm sure. So far, this is not very hypothetical. (laughs) And you then Mm -hmm. decide, and then you decide to watch an episode of a Jerry Anderson show. Oh, right, yeah. Now, it could be me any day of the week. It could be Space 1999. It could, could be, be yeah. Fall for the Falls. It could be Supercar. Mm-hmm. It could be Thunderbirds. It could even be, I don't know, Space Precinct. Whatever you like. Could, could be, yeah. But most importantly of all, in this hypothetical scenario, mm-hmm. what kind of snack are you going to have? What? Uh, what? What while I'm watching? Yeah. Uh, about Space Invaders? Do they? You know, those little crisps? <laughs> I like the theme uh, you've got for it. Anyway, this yeah. is sort of leading me into something. I can't promise it's going to be fab, but it is sort of right. loosely strung together facts. Anyway, okay. it turns out that the people who make TV shows are just as hungry as the people who watch them. Do you see what I did there? In- <laughs> Not really, no. <laughs> no, nor me. In addition to meals, production crews are often served snacks, tea, coffee and other refreshments throughout the very long shooting days as I'm sure you remember Richard James from all your recent things. The department in charge of this vital task is called Craft Services. Okay. Or Crafty I suppose sometimes. Um, Mm. It's so named because they basically serve the crafts people lighting art department uh, all the rest Uh of the crew and they you know they feed them Uh, yeah now craft services has changed over the years especially since covid but the crews of thunderbirds did not miss out Uh, and according to dad's former secretary una scott who was interviewed for biography she had some insights Um, canteen lady iris richens brought out a trolley of hot and cold food three to four times a day what? I know. Uh, wow. All to the enthusiasm of the hardworking crew. Dad, in particular, enjoyed snacking from this trolley from time to time. I should say, yes. Do you know any of his favourite snacks from the Thunderbirds snack trolley? <laughs> uh, was he a fan of the old Fondant Fancy? I don't think Fondant Fancies were on said no, trolley. Uh, you're thinking what about country you're th- slices? You're thinking uh, 1960s Industrial Park, uh. Slough... 
I think you're going a bit too glamorous here. So yes, I was rather, wasn't think, I? Think more sort of. Are, are we going English to sausages and lunch. burgers and things like that? Even that's too much. No, Is Pic- it? pickled onions, pickled walnuts, <laughs> and allegedly <laughs> stuffed olives. Although I'm not sure about Ooh, that one. That sounds a bit seventies to me. Uh, uh, probably the stuffed olives in the seventies. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, anyway, yeah. he also <laughs> d- developed quite the taste for bovril. Oh, did he? Which I used to think was disgusting, and I've actually come to quite like now. Uh, does bovril travel outside of the UK? Oh, that I don't know. Yes, it's the know. beef extract, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, condensed beef extract. It's kind yeah, of brown yeah. and tarry. Syrupy, yes. Yeah, it's got the consistency of Marmite, but the, the flavour of, um, well, condensed mm. beef. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. when you put it like that, it's not quite so attractive, <laughs> is it? If, if you'd like to know some other of uh, Dad's favourite snacks, then uh, I'll also insert wine gums uh, and Werther's Original Toffees. Oh, um, yes, we know that. That's been mentioned before. We're I think, a yes. huge favourite, and he would often grab a bag on the way home from Pinewood and eat the yes. entire thing uh, yes. while sitting watching the news in the evening. Uh, yes. So, there you go. What? It, what, is that it? Yes. Is that is that the fab fact? Yes. Oh, That is okay. it. So, Posteros, right. what are your favourite Ander munchies? Uh, mm. Obviously, Richard James would be a fan of Creon crisps, but how about some Thunder Biscuits? I don't know. Do let us know. <laughs> Podcast at jerryanson.com. Can you tell it's been a long day? I uh, can tell, <laughs> yes. You've got a bit of a sugar rush. Have you been uh, topping up on the old uh, Dr. Pepper again? I'll tell you what I did have. I had a lovely uh, bag of um, chocolate covered raisins <laughs> on the it. way home. That'll I think it. I may yeah, have overdone yeah. with that. Um, mm. Now, also, I'll, I'll tell you what, from the, C- from the set of Space Precinct. Oh, yeah. The lovely Christine Glanville. She wasn't yes. a big snacker, but have I ever told you about her water habit? Uh, no, not on air, no. No. <laughs> well, Christine was adamant that you should never drink plain tap water. And so quite oh. often when we would sit in the uh, on-set canteen, which was actually the station house canteen in Space Precinct, wasn't it, when they would, oh, people yes. would sit yes. down there, uh, yep. she would always put a pinch of salt in her tap water. What? Oh, what? That's like what's a saline solution, yeah, basically. Exactly. Is what a she's life, drinking. A lifelong wow. habit. There you go. Oh, so I gosh. bet you. I bet at the start of this podcast and the start of this fan facts, you were not expecting to know a list of Jerry Anderson's favourite snacks, both sweet and savoury, and Christine Glanville's salty water habit. So that, there you that's, go. That's true. I, I, I can honestly say I was not expecting that. Yes, you're right. Oh, okay. Well, I think that's probably enough for this one, isn't it? I just, I, I'm, 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 I've run out of snack facts. Uh, oh, and that's what I'll say when we bring oh, this one to a close. No, so you've that's blown it. That's the end of this week's uh, um, snack, snack fact. fact. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it might be somehow. Oh, dear. Yeah, catering is often the best uh, thing, though, for a, a TV or film production. Oh, I, I agree. During Space Precinct, I remember we used to get uh, food sent over from the Pinewood Canteen. Mm. And it would always be, they'd come round at about 11 o'clock and ask what we want for lunch. And it would arrive in sort of bowls and plates with uh, tin foil over the top. Yep. And by the time we'd broken for lunch at 1, 1.30, if you were lucky, it was still tepid. Oh, delicious. Yeah. Mm, lovely. Yeah, sandwiches. I remember the puddings as well, like apple crumble and custard, things like that. Mm. Yeah, it's always good. In fact, very often, and you're probably the same, as you drive around or walk around, you might sometimes see unit signs for things that are being filmed locally. And it's always tempting. <laughs> At about one o'clock, half past one, just to bold as brass, just mm. go straight for the catering van and say, uh, yeah, I'm, uh, I'm with the uh, Sparks. I'll have the chicken, please. <laughs> Just see if it works. <laughs> I bet it does a lot of the time. Yeah, I bet it does. Yeah, it's worth a go. Yeah, yes. Nice. So you're basically uh, recommending uh, lots of theft. Uh, yeah, let's move on quickly, shall we? Uh, now, let's move <laughs> on to our post bag because people have been emailing us, <laughs> luckily, to podcast at jerryanderson.com. Uh, for example, this one here is from Chris Turner, who says, Dear Jamie, Richard and Chris, as a long-time podstron, I know that you like to hear from listeners about the Anderson shows we've been watching, listening to or reading about. Yes, Chris, we do. Well, he says, I'm currently working my way through all 32 episodes of the original Captain Scarlet, accompanied by Chris Bentley's book, The Complete Captain Scarlet, which I bought when my young children were enjoying the early 1990s reruns on the BBC, but strangely ended up on my own bookshelf. Hmm. Hmm. 
Uh, the excellent Spectrum is Indestructible by Fred McNamara, and of course, The Vault, also by Chris Bentley. I was lucky enough to see all the Super Mario Nation shows at the time of their original transmission, but it was Captain Scarlet that really captured my 11 year old imagination. I was fascinated by the whole setup of the Spectrum organization, the vehicles, storylines, and the presence of clearly identified villains, with the twist that they could be anyone who had been recreated by the Mistron's process of regeneration, which mm. added a creep malevolence to the storylines. At that age, says Chris, I didn't understand the concept that these shows were darker. I was just thrilled by the stories and the heightened realism compared to the earlier shows. Having watched it again several times now, I think the finale of the opening episode, The Mistrons, at the top of the London car view, is probably the most compelling scene of any of the Super Mario Nation shows and would stand up against any action TV show of the time. Mm. The action and editing are that good. One irony that hasn't escaped me, says Chris, is that I watched the original broadcasts in black and white, completely counteracting the whole colour-themed premise of the Spectrum organisation, <laughs> uh, although I got the full effect from the TV21 comics. I guess the only compensation was that we lived in the ATV Midlands region, so I'm sure we got all of Jerry's shows when they were originally transmitted. Watching the shows, continues Chris, and reading the books at the same time is a great way to get a deeper understanding of each episode. But one theme which keeps cropping up for me is that the 25-minute runtime doesn't always allow the stories to be fully developed. I've always felt that there are so many more stories to explore in the world of Captain Scarlet and Spectrum, and New Captain Scarlet did that to great effect. It's also brilliant to see the Captain Scarlet story further expanded in the new graphic novels which have come out this year. I am hoping we'll be seeing more of these developments in the near future. Uh, one mm -hmm. quick question. In Pod 221's Fab Fact, Jamie told us about the UFO script that was never televised, The Patriot, yes. written by Leo Eaton. Now, at least it's possible to read the script on ufoseries.com, and Jamie has also mentioned the House of Dolls episode of New Captain Scarlet, which never made it to screen as it was deemed to be too scary for a young audience. But my question is, is there a copy of this script which is available to read? Thanks for all the great work you do. Best wishes, Chris Turner. Thanks, Chris. Um, mm. Well, there's a lot of stuff in there, isn't there? Yeah, Nicely yeah. unpacked. Absolutely. But, I mean, in answer to your final question about House of Dolls, there isn't a copy publicly available, but we've got one that's floating around internally. Yeah. Um, yeah. But I shall say no more about that. Yeah, OK, fair enough. <laughs> uh, interesting, though, how he thinks that that final scene of the first episode of Captain Scarlet is the best in any Super Bowl yeah. Nation series. So here's a challenge to our listeners. What moment or scene... Out of all the Jerry Anderson episodes and series that you've watched, do you think is the standout, hands down, best scene of any Jerry Anderson series ever? Ooh. And I'm not talking about when uh, Officer Orin uh, raises his head out of the dumpster. Oh, that's in, uh, my space favorite. Prison. I love yeah, is it? that. Yeah, I know, I know. But apart from that, mm. let us know what is your favourite scene from any Jerry Anderson series that sums up the whole of the Super Mario Nation or live action era for you. Also, interesting point there that, of course, yes, many people would have watched those series in black and white. Yes. We know them in, you know, in full glorious colour, you know, this from Stingray onwards. But uh, yes, a lot of people, even throughout the 70s, would have been watching those in black and white, of course. Yeah. I'm now thinking we should do a social media black and white challenge with a close up of just a tunic in uh, grayscale and say, which captain is this? <laughs> yes, I bet you can right. identify some of them because yeah. of the background or stuff. But yeah. Yeah, possibly. That's Tough. Nice. Paul Davis has got in touch from Bedfordshire. Hello, GA podcast team. In this week's podcast, Jamie asked for pictures of the new Thunderbird 1 launch base sign up on display in Podsteron Man Cave. Oh, I did, yes. You did, yes, a few weeks ago now. As such, please find pictures of mine attached. And I must say, it looks resplendent above the door on the inside of my cave, amongst other collectibles. Thank you to the Anderson Entertainment team for producing such an original and brilliant piece of merchy merch merch. Uh. I think Jamie previously mentioned that uh, like a true Jerry Anderson production and in these post-COVID times it's made in the UK so that's also excellent news it is indeed yeah uh, I might embellish it at some point with either a model of Thunderbird 1 or a lemon squeezer <laughs> uh, I must admit it's actually something I'm getting for Christmas but I was keen to submit photos as requested so temporarily blue tacked it into position before returning it to its packaging oh ah, that's lovely and I'm just looking at the pictures right there. that's lovely aren't they I know, isn't that great uh, yeah, I look brilliant. forward to screwing it to the wall properly after the big day says Paul uh, also at the beginning of uh, this week's podcast the origin of using the term the pod instead of episode was discussed and this got me thinking if pod 2 did have a full set of 221 pods as it was then to choose from how long would it take for pod 221 to appear on the conveyor belt <laughs> beneath the heavy transporter 
Ooh. Well, are you ready? No, well, Chris, uh, luckily, Paul's done the uh, calculations for oh, us. I was about to do them, so I'll put my, <laughs> I'll put my calculator away in that case. Well, he says, having checked on Pit of Peril, where a complete sequence of five of the pods can be seen to slide beneath Thunderbird yes. 2, it takes approximately 4.5 seconds per pod Ooh. to slide into position as the conveyor moves along. Therefore, Virgil would be waiting around 16.5 minutes for pod 221 to appear. <laughs> All the best and thank you for brightening Monday mornings. PWOR, FABSIG, and that's from Paul Davis in Bedfordshire. Well done, Paul. Well worked out. Amazing. So, do you suggest that we have 16 and a bit minutes of pod conveyor belt sounds at the very start of the podcast before we start talking? <laughs> Is that what you're suggesting, Paul? Yeah, I mean, we can I do that's that. A, that's a great idea. Yeah, yeah. Of course, it would get longer every week by, uh, by 4.5 seconds. Mm. Okay. Mm. Yeah, well, we'll start that, that next week. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> and one final one. Now, this is from Alan J. Porter, writer and podcast, who says, Hi, Jamie and Richard. I just got back from the Dragon Con event in Atlanta, Georgia, where I had a great time among 80,000 other pop culture geeks. I thought you might like this. I was speaking on a panel about the James Bond movie's 60th anniversary, and while waiting to start, someone asked me about the Bond-related T-shirt I was wearing. Partway through the conversation, I said something along the lines of, whenever a parcel of T-shirts arrives, my wife always wonders if there'll be Bond stuff or from the Jerry Anderson store. A voice at the back of the room went, wait, there's a Jerry Anderson store? Yes! After I told them about the store and the podcast, about half the audience in the packed room got their phones out and started clicking away, so hopefully you'll see a small spike in US T-shirt orders in the coming weeks. Oh, it's good lovely. That's brilliant. Thank uh, you. He says, I also managed to give both TV21 and the Joe 90 comic a shout out when I was on the Star Trek in comics panel. And I nominated the Eagle as a contender in the Starship Smackdown panel I was on, <laughs> but unfortunately it didn't get picked. I didn't no. see much Anderson stuff in the massive Four Floors Dealers Mart, but I did pick up a couple of packs of Space 1999 trading cards for a friend. I hope you enjoyed these and a moments from over the weekend. Oh! And I also suggested that they have a Worlds of Jerry Anderson panel next year that I'd be happy to run. So fingers crossed. Brilliant. Thanks for all the great work you do and for being regular companions on my morning walks via the podcast. And that's from Alan J. Porter. Thank you, Alan. Thanks, Alan. That's lovely. Yeah. Uh, really nice to have Podsterons out doing their bit to spread, yes. the, spread the word. So thank you Absolutely. so much. Absolutely. Particularly if you find yourself at an event where you're surrounded by people who you know are going to you know, love Jerry Anderson yeah. and may not know about the podcast or the store or the wonderful things that... Anderson Entertainment have been up to over the last few years. Let them know. Yeah, brilliant. It's yeah. Mm. I mean, it's like that, like that question I had at um, one of the screenings of the documentary, which mm. said, uh, "Jamie, will you be doing anything to celebrate the legacy of your father?" <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> Just a bit. Yeah, we do Just quite a, few a lot, but um, yeah. obviously we're not. As, as I said to him then, we're not doing a good enough job if you don't know that. So <laughs> must try harder. It's difficult. No, but it's difficult reaching people, isn't it? And very often, word of mouth is uh, you know very useful. Yes. So don't underestimate that word of mouth, Podstrons. Yeah. You know, don't assume your mates know all about us because they probably yeah. don't. That's right. Uh, all for now, but do keep the uh, emails coming in podcast at uh, and I shall read them out next time. Wonderful. I, yeah. look for, I look forward to it enormously. Sure yeah. uh, now, would you like some Jerry Anderson news? Because I've got quite a lot of news to share oh, and not a lot on. of time to share it in. Okay, go on then. Let's get on with it. Uh, what now? Yes, come on, Jerry Anderson news. Come on. Uh, all right, I'll, I'll quick, start. Quick, quick, quick. Uh, no, quicker than that. Quicker than that. Come on. Okay, it's coming now. Good. It's the quick, Jerry quick, quick, Anderson quick, 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 news. News, 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 news. Yeah, news, come on, come on, come on. No, <clears throat> Jamie, come on. So much to get through. <sighs> right. Here we go. So, this is a very exciting week because not only have we got the UFO Shadow Technical Operations Manual coming out uh, for pre order, but we also have Thunderbirds Day this Friday. So, stand by oh, yes. for all of that stuff and everything in between. Now, Ooh, great. tonight, that's the 26th of September, if you're listening on the day of release. At 6.30pm UK time, that's BST, uh, or GMT plus one, depending on uh, how you like to read these things. Yep. Chris Thompson, Andrew Clements, and I, unfortunately, will be, uh, unfortunately for watchers, not for uh, uh, Chris and uh, AC, I hope. <laughs> well, um, we'll leave that to them. We'll see, yeah. Uh, yeah. The three of us, anyway, will be doing a live stream tonight on the Jerry Anson YouTube channel, the Facebook page, and across uh, other social channels, revealing more pages from the UFO Shallow Technical Operations Manual, as well as ah. showing you all the bits and pieces from the special edition, telling you all about that, and letting you know how to get hold of one. 
So Ooh. that is tonight. If you haven't seen the previous one we did last week, you can rewatch that across all of our social channels. Just go to uh, youtube.com slash Jerry Anderson TV um, mm -hmm. and click on videos and you'll see it in the lives there. That's just me and Chris going through how he did it. Just It was brilliant actually chatting to him and hearing how he came up with loads of technical solutions for problems between real life sets and model sets and exterior locations and interior locations all within yeah. the world of shadow just really nicely done mm -hmm. uh, now if you don't have time to make it to the live tonight no problem uh, you can join the ufo shadow technical operations manual mailing list by going to shop.jerryanderson.com scrolling down there's a red button there uh, to read more about the ufo book and you can sign up on the list there that means we will notify you five minutes before pre-order goes live now pre-order goes live at 5 30 p.m uk time on the uh -huh. 27th of september so that's tuesday tomorrow that is if you're listening on the day of release and the the limited editions we expect to go extremely quickly i think for the space 1999 ones they sold out in two hours so wow if you are keen yeah. to get one then follow instructions and uh, get on the mailing list and grab one as soon as you can because we'd hate you to miss out. Um, they're individually numbered, they're lovely, beautifully presented things and it kind of feels like a, a thing you would be given as a shadow operative when you join shadow. So uh, yeah, lovely. Mm, it's a lovely thing. Now, during the rest of the week, there's a load of other articles and bits and pieces coming out on the website. So do uh, keep an eye on jerryanderson.com. You may have seen also on the shop that we are making space for some upcoming products by saying goodbye to yes. over a hundred products wow. from the store. Uh, it's the end of the road for those products, which is why we've called it the end of the road collection. Uh, and that all goes away at midnight on Friday. So at the okay. end of this week, well, 23.59, I suppose, okay. on the 30th. So, um, yes, that's, mm. you know, grab those. There's, there's, I mean, there's Thunderbird stuff, there's Supercar, there's Scarlet, there's Space 1999, there's UFO, there's Supercar, Lovely. all sorts of stuff. But they are not coming back. They are going away for good because we need to make some space for new exciting things. Uh, sure. If you've been on the website, did you meet the Thunderbirds cast on Saturday? Oh. There's a really lovely video uh, yes. where you get to meet all of the Thunderbirds audio cast. Joe and Justin and John, it's all the J's, and Genevieve, but that's a G, uh, mm -hmm. and yeah. Wayne. <laughs> yeah, it's always, yeah. always okay. one, isn't there? It doesn't join always in with one, the theme. It's always Wayne, yeah. Yeah, but it's a really nice piece. You can hear how they did the voices, how they recorded it, what they think about it. It's a really lovely thing. Um, yeah. And that's come just in time because on Friday, the 30th of <gasps> September, mm. well, yes, Curry. you know exactly what it is. <laughs> You and I are having a curry, but yeah. we're doing a fab live. Oh, yes, 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 that's right. Sorry. To celebrate Thunderbirds, Thunderbirds Day. Day. yes. 6.30 p.m. UK time. Richard and I and some other people will be yeah. live at the Moxie Hotel in Slough. You're welcome to come along and join us. I mean, yeah. you know, don't expect anything exciting to happen. We'll just be talking and <laughs> yeah, we can it. wave yeah. at you and stuff. But uh, if you'd like to come and join us there and, uh, and have a pint or something, that would be great. Um, yeah. But we will be releasing all sorts of goodies. Uh, this year's Thunderbirds calendar, some Thunderbirds Day t-shirts, the Thunderbirds vs. The Hood audio drama goes live on Friday, and also, anything mm -hmm. can happen, the TV21 audio annual. So there's oh, loads wonderful. and Great. loads and loads of stuff. We might even possibly do a little Thunderbirds Danger Zone live playthrough at the end of the, oh, uh, the Fab Live, oh, too. Might we? That could go terribly wrong. Yeah, we might, uh, <laughs> yeah, we might kill absolutely. Eddie Hausman. That would be awful, wouldn't it? Anyway, uh, so yes, this week is Great. a bit bonkers crazy, brilliant, um, can't wait for it, yeah. but it's going to be a busy one. So hopefully we'll see you at one of the lives and maybe even in person at the Moxie and Slough. I mean, don't travel too far. Don't, you no, know, no, sure. don't, don't yeah. make a big schlep of it, but no, if you no, 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 no. are local-ish and you want to come down and sit in the bar yeah, and yeah. say hello, then brilliant. Afterwards, it'd be great. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Ooh. Yeah, great. Anyway, there's loads of other yeah, stuff going well on, done. I'm sure. But that's quite enough for this week. So that, then, is the end of this week's Jerry Anderson News. That was the news. Quite enough news. <laughs> You're right. It More was quite enough. Quite yeah. enough for one week. Yeah. yeah, that's right. Got to space it out. Otherwise, there'd be no news next week, would there? Exactly. Whew. You know? That was lucky. Uh, now, are you on Facebook? And if you are, why are you not part of the official Jerry Anderson podcast listeners group? The it's great quite question. easy. Yeah, you just go to facebook.com forward slash groups forward slash podstrons. You answer a few questions. We let you in. You can join in the fun. Now, before I read out some messages that Podstrons have been posting this week, I must just say that David Hollis has shared some news of his own tragic loss on the Podstron group uh, just last week. And I know I speak for all the Podstrons when I say, David, our thoughts are with you. 
Now, Esther Jones said, yesterday was my birthday, and among my nerdy, geeky presents my dad got me was my favourite Captain Scarlet character. I don't have much Anderson merch, so I'm really happy to add Captain Blue to my slowly growing collection. Nice. Well, that's thoughtful, isn't it? So that led me to think, what's your favourite ever Jerry Anderson-related birthday present? Hmm? Let us know podcast at jerryanderson.com maybe in the subject line maybe put and a present just so we know what's your favourite ever birthday or Christmas present that you received from the Jerry Anderson universe was that the best Anderson portmanteau you could come up with yeah, well I didn't have long did I uh, Richard Crane says I would love to see Thunderbird Solar Danger adapted into audio as it's quite a long comic strip 32 pages long Oof. in fact yeah any danger of that happening Jamie any solar danger of that <laughs> happening I see what you did there uh, but I mean, potentially, yes. I mean, we've yeah. we've got some other ones we've already recorded. I, can I say that? Yeah. I, I, I think well, I might have. We just oh, did. Yeah. Well, if, if if somebody was here to tell me off, I would have been told off. But thankfully, nobody's here. Yes. So yeah, there's okay. a couple more that we've recorded, and uh, uh, and uh, will be will be news of that very very soon. I should think. Yeah. Maybe even this week, possibly. Okay. Right. Seeing as it's uh, Thunderbirds Day. Yeah. Exactly oh, what I, see, I was thinking. I you see. Right. Yeah, uh, yeah. Now, just uh, going back to the birthday theme, Jeff Tilly says, "Just curious, but who else has had an Anderson themed cake made for a birthday of theirs?" Ooh. And he posted a picture of a lovely Thunderbird 2 cake from his 40th birthday. Cool. Nice, eh? Did you ever have a Thunderbirds-themed cake, Jamie, as a child or, or as an adult? Um, I mean, I should imagine you would, but... Uh, I actually don't think I did have a Thunderbirds-themed cake. No? Um, well, isn't that amazing? Okay. No, <clears throat> I mean, in Dad's collection of bits and pieces uh, at home, I've got a Thunderbird 2 little um, model that was made with 48 on the on the top of it instead of two which i believe <laughs> was done for dad's 48th birthday yeah uh, and I sat see. on a cake somewhere but obviously that wasn't oh, the cake itself but no, no I, I don't think i did have a cake no. i'm afraid okay. sorry yeah, interesting. Uh, Isabel Saucier has posted in Pod 223, there was a question about the difference in where the heads attached for male and female puppets. Yes, there was indeed. I remember that. She says, I think I've read somewhere that one of the reasons there was a difference is that most of the male puppets wear shirts and high collars, so the attachment at the base of the neck is hidden by those. However, the female puppets often have outfits that would show the neck and shoulders, yes. so an attachment at the base of the neck would have looked strange, which is a very good point. I think you're quite right as well. That's yeah. very well observed. That's right. Excellent. And finally for now, Gareth Randall. Here's an interesting thought. How close, says Gareth, are we to companies like Big Finish being able to use modern AI tools like Respeecher to create near enough exact clones of original voices? One of the reasons I've always found audio versions of old TV hard to listen to is that the voices are never right. When the original actors are still alive, they inevitably sound significantly different. And where new voice artists have had to be used, they obviously sound plain wrong, uh, says Gareth. For example, nobody's ever done a convincing Jeff Tracy. No matter who's attempting it, it always comes out as generic, gruff American rather than anything close to Peter Dunley's very distinctive performance. And while it was great that Gareth Thomas performed Blake for various uh, Big Finish Blake 7 stories, his voice had changed so much over the intervening period that it just didn't work for me. But it seems like we're potentially at a point, says Gareth, where software could be used to sample the original voices to create entirely new dialogue that actually sounds like the original actors from 60 years ago, which is both terrifying and exciting. It yes. is. <clears throat> Thoughts? Well, I mean, my first hmm. thought is I must disagree with you on the Jeff Tracy thing because I think <laughs> John Colshaw sounds fantastic. But what we've noticed yes. is the experience of audio for people is so different from person to person it's quite ah, astonishing sure. you can have two, yeah, some two people, people just can't take it they yeah. listen to the exact same thing one will say oh that's just it's, it's almost like I'm listening to, to, to Peter Dinley talk the other yeah. person will say it sounds nothing like him it's the yeah. same audio listening at the same time same headphones yeah. all that and yet their, their experience will be different and I think audio is very specific from person to person so yeah, interesting. you've got the ethical dilemma then of you know who do you contact to get permission to mimic somebody's voice how yeah. do you remunerate them or their estate yes, for yes. using it once you've mm -hmm. created it do you own it because they're not performing it and then something like respeech or one of those um bits of software still has to have an actor performing it so they still have to mimic the delivery and the pacing 
um, oh. and all that kind of stuff. So yeah. it's it's a really tricky thing. And then with all yeah. those costs, I mean, we looked into it for da- the documentary about Dad because sure. we were going to reproduce some of the audio. Um, uh-huh. And it was about £10,000 to, to clone a voice. Wow. Okay. So if you want to do that yeah. for a cast of 10 characters, you're sinking a hundred grand immediately. That's right. <laughs> and that yeah. isn't going to be commercially viable for almost any audio drama, I'd say. Yeah. So it's really interesting. interesting. I'm sure yeah. the cost of it will come down over time. But then, of course, yeah. I mean, do, yeah. Do you lose something by having it kind of AI produced? Maybe. I mean, you'll certainly lose the performance element. Even, you know, I mean, I take, uh, I take his point there. Uh, from uh, that's Gareth, isn't it? I take his point that you know, uh, having new actors perform old roles uh, is never going to be precise. Of course, no. it isn't because they're not those people. And more to the point, they're not those people when they were twenty, thirty years old. You know, it's no, no use getting uh, Shane Rimmer voice from later in his life to, to voice Scott Tracy because that wouldn't be specific enough. Yeah, that's the other thing, isn't it? You're so, you're limited in in your audio yeah. source as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so that's I mean, right. we could do a whole. I mean, podcast on well, this. perhaps we should. Perhaps yeah. we shouldn't. There we go. <laughs> Fair <laughs> enough. Uh, that's all for now. But do join in on the Facebook group, a lovely group of people, very supportive and mindful of each other and respectful of each other, yeah. posting all sorts of pictures of merch and the latest models they're building and their cosplay. Uh, it's quite easy. Head on over to Facebook and join in the fun. And who knows, maybe one day I might be reading out your post. Mine? No, 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 not yours. I wasn't talking to you. Oh, sorry. Okay. No, no, I thought you were busy doing something else. Sorry, I was talking to the listener at home. Oh, okay, fine. That makes perfect yeah. sense. So I was distracted because I was looking ahead in the script to what's next. Uh, oh, were you? Yes. I mean, I can't blame you, to be fair. And well, you never look at the script, so somebody's got to to keep this <laughs> blooming thing There's moving. There's a script? You know there is. I send it to you every time and then you, then you delete it. Um, <laughs> would you like to hear the next bit, which is obviously our well, it's interview this the week? Interview, yeah. Well, as I said, yes. it's the first of four parts Brilliant. with the wonderful Chris Bentley. Mm-hmm. Now, as you'll be hearing in uh, the coming weeks, Stingray saved his life. Really? Indeed, Literally? It did. You will have to wait to find out what that means. Uh, now, Chris is a long, 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 long time fan, an expert on all things Anderson, uh, and the author of multiple books on all things Anderson, including... The Complete Book of Thunderbirds, The Complete Book of UFO, Captain Scarlet the Vault, Space 1999 the Vault, uh, and many other things, including The Complete Jerry Anderson. Um, I've known Chris since I was a wee lad uh, in short shorts and with a full head of hair. So um, (laughs) it was very nice having a chat with him. We had a bit of a a delay on the line, so prepare for some slightly weird interrupts from me where I was trying to uh, not leave enormous gaps in the discussion. I'm sure Laura, our editor, has done a lovely job making it all sound beautiful. But here we go for Chris Bentley, part one. Hello, I'm Chris Bentley, and I've written a number of books about Jamie's father, Jerry Anderson. It's not often somebody says Jamie's father, but I like the fact that you did say that, because normally I'm Jerry Anderson's son. So... (laughs) Well, you're it's the one good I'm to have it the other way around for a change, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's lovely. I mean, I, as we'll we'll talk about in this, I, I don't tire of being referred to as as Jerry Anderson's son. But you have known me since I was a, a wee little lad, haven't you? Uh, I think perhaps not not quite so wee. I first met your mm-hmm. father in 1989. So yep. uh, I think the point at which he would have started bringing you to conventions, how old would you have been then? That's probably mm-hmm. when we first met. Um, I reckon 91, so six. Yes. Okay. Yes. I, I, I don't particularly remember you at that age. I think the... Oh, Chris. I'm sorry, but the, <laughs> the the furthest back I can go is thinking, uh, oh, this might like, take you back a bit. We came as a group to your house once in, uh, must have been about 1997, and uh, marveled yep. at the, the the swimming pool in the in the garden, which was covered at the time. Yep. I think it must have been must have been winter. And uh, let me see, there was a. I remember using the downstairs lavatory. Where there was a like a stained glass, <laughs> what a memory! <laughs> like a like a stained glass window of Stingray. Do you remember that? Yeah. And okay. Was, uh, okay. So that's before we moved. So that would have yes, been 90, yes. 95, 96, Yeah. 
Really? Uh, well, okay. Uh, and there was a very like, lovely like framed illustration kind of poster thing that Bob Bell had done yep. when he was a prisoner of war. And he was uh, yeah, helping Pygmalion, to produce... Yeah, Pygmalion, that was the poster for. Yes, that's right. And he was helping to produce uh, yep. shows in, in the camp, and he designed this poster yep. and, uh, and uh, given it to your father at some point. And uh, I think your dad was you know, yeah. very proud of that, really, because it showed... You know, Bob's illustrated Bob's history, uh, which was quite mm. remarkable. And I think I seem to remember at the time you were painting uh, a little model of Isambard from Lavender Castle, which is why it makes me <laughs> makes me think that it must have been about ninety seven thereabouts when it was being made. Ooh, I think you've yes. been down to the you've been mm. down to the studio doing some doing some like yeah. a bit of helping out. Yeah, so the stained glass window is in the previous house. It must, it, maybe it was just around the around the move type. But yeah, I, I painted a Sproggle and an Isambard um, mm. when they were doing Lavender Castle. So that's a very very happy memory. Is that is that on the trip when we all went down for a, a, an en masse Chinese meal at the Chef Peking in Henley? Oh, we did. Yes, we did. Maybe that was maybe that was my birthday celebration. Your father gave I think me some it might very have nice, been, and I, some very nice gifts. Yes. Uh, yeah, so but do I remember the, correctly, Chris, that you are not a you're not a fan of crispy duck? I'm not a fan of crispy duck. No, no, I'm I'm <laughs> I wouldn't say I'm allergic to uh, to crispy duck, but it, it does make me wretched it. So the fact that <laughs> yeah. the fact that everybody had crispy duck uh, that was a bit off putting <laughs> for your birthday. Yeah. <laughs> yes, yes, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay, so I remember I remember that fairly well. Your dislike for crispy duck at a Chinese restaurant uh, has stuck with me ever since. Yeah, uh, yes. Maybe I'm maybe I'm conflating two different visits. Then, if it's uh, if that was the if that was the house in a different house. But anyway, never mind. But that's that's what I remember. I remember you painting the the little lavender castle models, and and then of course going to the Chinese as well. So yeah, yeah. yeah we, that was, I guess that was, we've known each other as long as that, at least. Yeah, it's been some time. Uh, mm. So, so then, assuming you 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 said you met with Dad in eighty nine, what mm. were the sort of circumstances surrounding the meeting, and what had, what had led up to that? Oh well, that on that occasion, that was Euphoria two in Manchester, which was a UFO convention, mm. uh, which was the it was the first Jerry Anderson convention I'd ever attended. I was just there as a there as a fan, and you know, met your father in the usual way of you know, getting the convention book signed and so on. And being so nervous, I could barely speak. <laughs> uh, but, uh, I mean, yeah, I mean, I think I met him a couple of times at conventions after that. But then on yeah. a personal level, uh, I didn't I didn't really get to know your dad until I became chairman of Fanderson in 1991. Mm. Mm. And uh, then, it, you know, we, we then sort of started to have a sort of like a a more one on one personal relationship. And I think yeah. he, I think he he felt that he could trust me with <laughs> a lot of secrets. Yep. And uh the very first thing I remember the very first conversation with him I remember was he wanted to take me on one side. This was a a convention called Plan B in London. And I'd just become chairman. And he took me on one side and explained to me various reasons why he didn't want Sylvia to be involved with the club in any way. Because, of mm. course, you know, as, as fans, you know, we all wanted to celebrate the, you know, celebrate the whole thing. And, uh, and but, but Jerry's course. very specific uh, instruction. You know, it was one of his conditions when we set up the fan club in the first place, apparently in 1981 was that it was yep. the Jerry Anderson fan club and that uh, we weren't to have any involvement with Sylvia in any way. And um, he wanted, he really, he just wanted me to, to know the reasons why he felt so strongly about that. And uh, mm. when he explained it to me, you know, I understood why that was so. Uh, yeah. I don't think I should go into the Pro- various things that he reasons. told me. Well, they, I'm sure some of them will be familiar, possibly to the to people who've watched the documentary that we released recently, mm. potentially. Yeah. And I'm sure some go, 
go beyond that, but clearly he had strong reasons for that. So I, well, that that's quite a way to get to know somebody personally is to have them suddenly <laughs> spilling their guts personally um, and beyond. Yeah, so in, in, fr- in the deep end, that, you might say. From that point. Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, in that those initial conversations and stuff, Chris, how... Um, what, what sort of a person did you think this guy was? Because clearly he was making the transition from, you know, the person who cr- created or was involved in creation of the shows to now someone who is becoming an acquaintance and, dare I say it, further down the line, a friend. Yes. Well, it was, it was a strange thing, really, I, I suppose, because, uh, you know, Jerry, uh, your father was always a, you know, a bit of a legend, really, you know, for the, for the mm. programs that he'd done. But I didn't really know anything about him personally at that time yeah but yeah it's it's one of those things i suppose where you get to you get to a stage with a lot of famous people that you might you you might have you know idolized from afar uh beforehand and then you get to speak to them you get to know them and they're just like regular folks and uh i found your father (laughs) very easy to easy to chat to and i uh, you know, found him very down to earth. He used to uh, he used to take me to lunch sometimes at, in the uh, in the big um, restaurant at Pinewood Studios. You know, the um, the big yeah. uh, wood panelled the ballroom. Uh, the ballroom, yes, yes, uh, that appears in where, um, what's that film? Who dares wins? It's uh, they did a lot of filming in there for it. Yeah, and of all the sort of fancy things that were on the menu, of course, you know, Jerry said, you know, what, you know, what would you like to eat? And I said, Oh, I don't know. What are you having? And he would always have just have fish and chips. And I, you know, I found that quite <laughs> endearing that, you know, out of, <laughs> out of all the fancy things that he could have eaten, you know, your dad just wanted fish and chips and he really enjoyed it. Yeah. And we'd be sitting there and, uh, you know, famous people would come in that knew him, you know, uh, I can't just think of particularly off the top of my head, top of my head some examples, but you know, really quite well known figures in the in the film industry, uh, and they all seem to you know mm. they all knew your dad, and they you know exchanged pleasantries, and you know, were very you know happy to see him and ask him what he was doing, and he'd ask what they were doing, and so yeah, and um, I think that's it. It's just you know eventually getting getting to know him as a person really that uh, that he, he was. Yeah. I I I never had a never had a problem with I've always found him very you know very amiable. I know he did have a reputation with some people, you know, having a bit of a quick temper or you know being very short with them. But my impression yeah. of him was that he was a he was a man who treasured loyalty in people. Uh mm. and if if he perceived That's that fair. people were being disloyal in some way then you know that was it. You know, he had he didn't have any time for them, and he would cut them out. But you know, if you if you were loyal to him, if you respected his his uh, you know his uh, opinions and so on, didn't necessarily have to agree with him, but you know, at least uh, at least see where he was coming from. You know, he would treat yeah, you very well. Definite respect and loyalty thing. Mm. Yeah, and again, you know, these are all consistent, familiar stories, particularly in, again in the wake of the of the documentary and people we've spoken to there and stories we've heard and tapes we've listened back to. It's, it's interesting to kind of see how consistent that is over the, over the decades. But mm. I think it's interesting to me that you, you were getting to know him at a time when he was, he crossed over from kind of coming back and making his mark with Terror Hawks in the, in the early mid eighties and tried to get stuff off the ground with, with space police, which ended up taking, about the best part of eight years mm. and in the meantime I then had to go into directing commercials and uh, you know doing what was necessary to make ends meet they controlled and lost the licensing rights for the ITC shows in the late 80s I think after copyright promotions came and poached the uh, the licensing rights from them and so actually kind of 89, 90 he was probably at quite a relatively low low ebb. I know he was trying to get things off the ground like GFI. And mm. then comes the Thunderbirds revival. So you saw that phase from a fan's point of view, from a connected point of view, from a professional point of view. So did you, did you sense any change in his attitude or his energy across that time? I don't think I really saw him before, much before the... The, the the Thunderbirds revival. 
uh, that was the same year that mm. I became chairman, and uh, we we Good timing. went to yeah, we went to a lot of well, it was, yes, it, we didn't. Uh, when I became chairman, we didn't know that was coming, but it, it then came up very quickly. We learned that the BBC <laughs> had picked up Thunderbirds, and uh, one of yeah. my first jobs as as chairman of Foundation was that to uh, you know encourage everybody to kind of up their game really, and uh, try and try and bring the club up to a, a level that I felt it, it needed and wasn't at that time. Mm. Which is no slight on the people who, the other people who were running it. You know, they were doing the best they could. But yeah. uh, actually, the, the Thunderbirds revival enabled us to, to make the club better because we got more interest. We had more fans coming in and joining the club and that gave us, you know, better budgets to work with so we could improve the quality of the magazine and so on. And... Yes, you could see uh, in your father there was a there was a, an excitement uh, that that his show had yeah. taken off again. You know, to, it could still uh, entertain yeah. entertain you know another generation of kids uh, in the early nineties in the way that it did. I mean, it's quite remarkable, and yeah, that that buoyed him, and 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 it helped. It really helped to, I think, to to revive his fortunes in terms of being able to get projects off the mm. ground. I mean, all right, GFI uh, sank, really, but, uh, yeah, that was very <laughs> – mm. but, uh, but that yes. Was a, that was uh, an unusual one. That was an unusual one, yeah. I, I think the I think the problems there were, the, were, were more to do with uh, the way it was being produced, the fact that, uh, yeah. you know, there, there wasn't the kind of communication that we have now uh, I mean, you know, you see sh- mm. animated shows all the time being made by, you know, half a dozen different animation studios around the world, and they all manage to produce a product that is consistent and, uh, and, and you know, very good quality. But at that time, your father was relying on animation studios in, in d- different countries, and they just weren't producing the same quality of material, and it didn't fit together, I guess, is... It just didn't seem to work yeah, somehow. Yeah, no, I think I think you're probably right. It, it's interesting though, actually. You talk about it like that, and it's I kind of now see it as maybe like a, the the pioneer of um, of remote production in a way because they're working with an animation studio in Russia mostly oh, yeah. at the time. And I remember Dad oh, yeah. saying he was taking out suitcases of uh, rubles in cash to pay the studio, <laughs> and then it getting is. over there and trying to do quality control and make things work, and it was all all very very difficult but it was it was an early attempt at remote production so you know uh, another pioneering move there maybe yeah well that's what your father was all about it was you know pioneering all the way down the line he was wasn't one for doing doing things just as people were already doing it he wanted to to push the technology push the push filmmaking in in some way and make it better you know that's why the Super marination shows, even from even from uh, Twizzle and Torchy, you know, they were they were a massive step up in comparison with what was being mm. produced in in you know television puppetry at the time, which were really just recorded puppet shows. And then you know even up to well you know Lavender Castle pioneering the use of stop motion animation in conjunction with CGI animation. Uh, you know that yep. hadn't been done at the time, and it it worked beautifully. Um, you know, there's some fantastic stop motion animation in Lavender Castle, uh, and I, it, mm, it's, it's a beautiful uh, it, show. It is a beautiful show, and I it, I think it's disappointing really that it doesn't have a you know isn't better known on the on the uh, on the international stage really. Uh, but then, of course, yeah. Well, there's know, a new, whole there's a whole rights issue around that. <laughs> oh, is there? Okay, okay. We'll leave that. Move on. New, new Captain Scarlet. Um, <laughs> Yeah. You know, he's making making a, a an animated show in high definition, uh, which was mm. you know unusual at the time and widescreen. And uh, yeah. well, right, we're talking talking two thousand and two thousand and four thereabouts. Yeah, in in my memory, that doesn't seem very long ago. But I mean, blooming out, it's nearly twenty years ago now. And uh, well, you don't, know, you'd... don't wish away the time, Chris. But yeah, it's coming up for twenty years. Yeah, and uh, you know, your, your dad was making high definition widescreen programs at, at a time when nobody, you know, it was really just only just coming in, and it certainly wasn't being done for you know for children's television. Um, mm. So yeah, that's another yeah. one. I think it's very no, think, disappointing that that right. didn't get didn't get more recognition at the time. Yeah, but as so often the way, it's you know, 
any one little tiny thing can go wrong, distribution or whatever else, and then it sort of doesn't get the exposure that's required. Well, there's much more of that to come. Thank you, Chris. Good. Yeah. Uh, wow. And I, uh, I, behind him, there was a lovely decanter of um, something brown, and I, I had to was check that? with him whether it was brandy or whiskey. And? I think it was brandy in the end. Oh. Uh, yeah, I'm not yeah. a fan of brandy. I can just about tolerate whiskey, oh, but brandy I can't do. Do you know what? I'll let you into a little secret. Oh, yeah. Um, well, I don't have to. Uh, oh. But t- ten years ago, I took Dad for his final holiday to Bordeaux, as you know, Richard. Ah, yes. And uh, Mum and I, uh, just a couple of weeks ago, revisited and um, yeah. retrod the same the same path and the same steps. Oh. And uh, wow. to toast him and them, we found a lovely little French restaurant, obviously, because we're in Bordeaux. Makes sense. Yeah. And um, <laughs> they had a great list of Armagnacs, and we found an Armagnac from the year that mum and dad were married. Oh, that's lovely. So I had one of those and, and uh, oh. toasted the old man out there. It was rather Beautiful. rather lovely and quite Gosh. sort of touching and cathartic. So there we go. I bet. I bet the memories came thick and fast, didn't they? It did indeed, yeah. It was, yeah. It was rather nice. Yeah. There you go. little personal yeah. insight there, uh, all because of... Uh, Chris Bentley's decanter. <laughs> there you go. Which is an excellent name for a one-act play. Uh, now, over on YouTube, people have been commenting beneath the video for uh, a previous fab fact concerning the unmade episode of UFO, which we spoke about earlier, The Patriot. Eamon McDermott says, it's a great shame I've just finished re-watching my complete set of UFO, and it really deserved at least another couple of series, in my opinion. You feel like you're just getting into the mindset of the UFO world when you're cut off, leaving you with so many unanswered questions and mm. so many possible storylines to develop. It was the unhappy endings of a number of episodes that lifted the whole concept of UFO and set it apart as superior to other sci-fi shows at the time. Not sure I'd be interested in a remake, because for me, Ed Bishop was the boss, aided and abetted, of course, by his brilliant co-stars. Well, Eamon, that's interesting. I wonder if you've heard the new uh, uh, Big Finish sort of... uh, Audio stories. Reboot, reimagining, yeah. Yeah, Yeah, because Barnaby K there does a sort of Commander Straker kind of inspired mm-hmm. approach but it's not mm-hmm. he's not trying to mimic mimic uh, Ed Bishop That's at right. all and I think it works yeah. really well yeah uh, John Smith has posted I think the Patriots storyline and plot sounds really interesting a UFO crashing in Africa then an alien held hostage definitely should be tried as an audio story and maybe a film providing it holds true to the original idea sort of outer limits but with a decent budget hmm yeah fair enough Zipalitra says, I'd love to know what other unmade episodes there were for other series, such as Thunderbirds or Captain Scarlet. Wasn't series two of Thunderbirds meant to be the same length as the first, but got cut down to six? Uh, Surely there's got to have been another lot of scripts submitted for the remaining unmade episodes, right? I mean, I'm sure there are other storylines and stuff noted down, but I'm not sure of any record of them. Yeah. Uh, Tom Senior, I was a little too young for UFO when it was first broadcast. I loved the effects, very Anderson. Unfortunately, I simply could not understand the more adult themes. It went a little over my head. Frankly, the show was very scary. Uh, When UFO was repeated decades later, I'd already bonded with Space 1999 and there was no going back. Shame, really. UFO looks amazing today, despite the silly costumes and those blooming purple wigs. (laughs) Silly? (laughs) Blooming purple wigs? What are you on about? They're lovely. I love you, dude. The height of fashion. (laughs) I'm Uh, wearing one right now. (laughs) <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, so there you go. Uh, do comment away beneath uh, the various YouTube videos that are on the Jerry Anderson YouTube channel, which I think now has something like oh, 68,000 subscribers or something, did I see? Or well, there's certainly a few on there, yeah. yeah there's, there's one or two. Uh, so, yes, to be sure that you don't miss a single video, of course, you can subscribe as well, and that way I think you get a notification every time a new video appears. Well, it does if you Why click the you little bell icon uh, after ah. you've subscribed as well. There you go. Do that. Uh, yeah, all for now, but uh, after Chris Dale's amazing randomizer coming up shortly, uh, I'll be taking a look at Twitter and what people have been saying about us over there. Oh, no. Yes, some of it quite good. Oh, that's a surprise. Yeah. Okay, yeah. fine. Well, uh, to hasten that and our, our hopeful praise from Twitter, yes. Yes. shall we just go straight into Chris Dale's lovely randomizer? Well, it might not be lovely. Oh, yeah. Okay, well, fine. Go on. Well, Any one way to find out? Chris will be here in a moment, and he will either himself or somebody else will or he'll find a way to pick a random episode of a random Jerry Anderson show because it's the randomizer. so that's it that's how it works yeah good right well uh, over to you yeah. randomizer Chris Dale oh just how long is this going to take yes it's alright Commander Straker nearly done just uh, waiting for the printout yes that's it and what have we got today oh okay well it's UFO today which one could it be perhaps you'd like to read the episode title Flight Path 
Yes, that's right. But to where? Well, let's find out, shall we? So, oh, ominous music welcomes back to the very early days of UFO. And uh, this is another one I've, I've noticed that um, we've completed now, well, with this episode, we'll have done the first four UFOs in production. Uh, identified computer affair, this and then survival. But we open with this chap. Um, his name is... Dawson, that's his name, uh, staggering away from a UFO towards a shadow jeep under the cover of, well, it's a very blue day for night. It's a very bright night. We're about to find out who this chap is. By the way, I, I was just thinking as the opening titles went, I was whistling along to them. I know I cut them, but I was whistling along to them. Does anyone else whistle along to the tunes? I, I do find I whistle along to most of the opening titles, um, particularly this and Joe um, and 1999 to a certain extent. Space Precinct's good to whistle to as well. Please let me know in the podcast listeners Facebook group. Dawson, medical technician, Shadow HQ. I'll be on duty in an hour. Your favourite Anderson theme tunes to whistle along to, but there we go. Big shock. This guy works for Shadow, and he's also just been involved with the aliens. Oh, when I was younger, I never thought that was a particularly effective opening, but now I, I kind of uh, appreciate it more. And here's someone else we can appreciate this week. It's only our guest star, none other than Arthur Daly himself, Mr. George Cole. Earth blast off, 15 minutes precisely. Who's having a... All personnel for leave, report to control sphere immediately. A bad day with some figures. Paul Roper, report to control sphere immediately. Countdown is proceeding. And there's a couple of deleted scenes here with um, Roper's journey back to Earth. There was a bit where uh, Joan Harrington came in and spoke to him and offered to help him with his bag and he was like, no, 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 leave me alone. And then there was a bit when he got back to Earth. Lift off complete. Oh, was that Jeremy Wilkin picking up some extra voice work there? Not sure. Um, yeah, there was a bit at the sort of um, lunar module shadow, almost like a customs room. Um, yeah, the scene was shot and, and just cut. And it's noticeably completely different from the uh, the sort of reception area we see later in The Cat with Ten Lives, because in what was shot for this episode, it's a proper set, whereas in Cat with Ten Lives, it's just stick Windsor Davies in that gatehouse over there at Pinewood Studios, and we'll just pretend, you know, show the model over there, and we'll just pretend. Um, and somehow they got away with it. I think when you've got, you know, the the facilities of a full working movie studio right there you can sort of improvise things like that and it's always nice to be outside rather than in a studio and um speaking of being inside george cole aka paul roper well, that is his name well not only does he own straker's car by the look of things he's uh, a bit anxious checking the time well, roper, have you made your the answer's no I won't do it. You're being stupid. It's no good. I can't go through with it. Do what you want to. Temper, temper. For God's sake, look, I said I won't tell you anything. There's always Carol. My wife? Yes. But leave her out of it, will you? Oh, dear. Yes, so Mr. Paul Roper of Shadow uh, is, is being threatened. Specifically, his wife is being threatened. This is uh, Sonia Fox. No, yes, this is Sonia Fox, the actress playing Carol Roper. And I kind of really like um, this setup. Paul, is that you? I know it's not typical for sort of shadow, uh, married shadow operatives. Normally everything goes to custard, and it does in this episode. But I kind of like that shadow is this, you know, this dark, sometimes awful world. And this woman just seems so sweet and innocent. And someone's forced his way into the home, and... <coughs> he turned the lights off. Swine. Luckily, here comes... Arthur Daly to save the day. Again, it's in it's in Straker's car. I find it odd in this episode. You do see, um, I, th I think later on, Paul Foster's car is being used by someone else. It's strange. Does everyone in the future just have this kind of car? Because we don't... I think in later episodes, you do very much associate that Straker's car, that's Foster's car. Lake might borrow one of them in, in later episodes. But otherwise, you don't see the sort of regular civilians using them and uh, here we go Arthur has arrived home I'm just going to keep calling him Arthur rather than uh, Roper 
Well, maybe I will, maybe I won't, I see. But uh, he's come home, the door's open. Unlocked, I should say, and he got... Uh, he was a bit aware that something was going to happen. He seems a bit confused now. He's already being threatened by naughty people, and now someone's uh, trying to do him with a shotgun. But, of course, it wasn't a naughty person, it was... Carol! Oh, what happened? Oh, that was horrible. When you came in the door, I... I thought he'd come back. So, yeah, this intruder guy, who, uh, spoiler alert, it's Dawson. It's all right. Oh. He came in. Well, no, he, he didn't even come in. He unlocked the door, put his hand round it, switched the lights off. Come on, it's all right. It's all right. <laughs> but yeah, I, I love that the Ropers uh, have this, this massive pink bedroom. She seems very sweet and innocent as Carol. And this is a, an interesting scene, and it goes back to something I mentioned uh, in drama at space city whenever that was the police or something on the randomizer which I, I oddly enough is the episode that was on the randomizer this week as i record this but i'm about five weeks ahead at the moment the ropers sleep in separate beds Leave the door open. Uh, as did the zeros um and it's surprising for this show considering how um uh let's say sexually active some of its characters are but we do see that later on in I think the psycho bombs, Daniel Clark and his wife sleep in separate beds. So there you go. It's an odd, uh, an odd running thing with this series. We can't show married couples in the same bed. How's your wife? You swine. You swine. All right, you've convinced you me. naughty man. I can't talk now. I'll call again. No. When? Tomorrow night, 12 o'clock. My car. I'll give you all you want then. It's got to be said that um, George Cole does not have a very uh, a very good haircut in this episode. I mean, I'm one to talk because right now a lawnmower couldn't make sense of my hair. But I also like that he's wearing, for the most part in this episode, he's wearing one of Roy Thinnis's old costumes from Doppelganger. Anyway, it's now next morning. There's a very nice house they're filming at. I'm not sure where that is. I'm sure it's been well documented, but... Uh, Carol is having tea in bed. Carol? It's quarter to nine. Get up, woman. Ooh, that pill suddenly did the trick. Yes. Listen, you mustn't worry about last night. It's all right now. Ah, oh, and he's going to drop a load of total lies in her lap. But it makes her happy, so... You phoned the police? Yes. They came round. You were asleep. And they said I, I was a very good man, and um, they came in their magic police helicopter. Picked him up a couple of miles along the road. What did he want? Oh, just an intruder. Apparently they've been after him for some time. Will I have to make a statement? I don't know. All's well that ends well. In the land of make-believe that um, um, Paul Roper is, is concocting for Carol. Yeah, maybe I will just call him Roper rather than Arthur. It's always anyone seems to talk about when they, they see this episode. It's like, whoa, Arthur Daly in UFO. And it's like, well, George Cole had a very long career Drink your tea. before Minder and after Minder. Here we go. It's taken a, a, quite a long time, actually, for us to get round to to Shadow or any of our recognisable characters. I do love a bit of uh, funky Shadow headquarters music. Ah, the music changed on me there, but I was ready for it. And here's uh, Dr. Schroeder with... What is that? That's a clock in a block of glass or something. 807 Roper for debriefing test, Doctor. Ah, so it's time for some tests on Mr. Roper. And who else is in the room? Oh, Shadow Technician Dawson. Naughty man Dawson. I assume you're familiar with this test. It measures how much strain goes into any decision you make. Yeah. It's amazing how hard we work even on the simplest decisions. Like whether or not to have a cup of coffee. Well, you know, this is Shadow, so everyone... That doesn't apply to anyone in Shadow, because do you want a cup of coffee is always met with, oh, yes, three, please. But this test that Roper's about to undergo, I know it's meant to look futuristic. Not the test. But I don't understand what any of it is about. And I think that is kind of a problem. It would not... You know, it, it, looking futuristic is one thing, even though it looks a bit dated now, but it would, nice, it would be nice to be a bit relatable. So that what was that? A picture of a shed... He got that right. A picture of a city. He got that right. A picture of... 
can't even tell what that is, but he got it wrong. Oh dear. He's sweating now. It's very stressful. Dawson's watching. There's a picture of the ground from the sky. He got that right. More ground. Got that wrong. More ground. He got that right. And he got that right, whatever it was. That looks like a boat. Got that right. Good man. Oh, there's um, a, a, a herd of some animals grazing by the water. He got that one wrong. What else? Come on. I'm doing good at this. Uh, that's the ground again. He got that right. More ground. He got that right. There's another city. He got that right. There's the inside of a factory. He got that right. Uh, no, that's wrong now. Uh, there's another city. He got that right. There was a picture from a book. He got that wrong. There's this, the ground again. He got that right. There's another page from a book. He got that wrong. Another page from a book. He got that wrong. And uh, I don't even know what that is. There's a map. He got that wrong. There's a city. He got that right. There's another city. <laughs> well, I can see why he was having problems with that. That test is completely incomprehensible. Oh, Just the man I was looking for. For me? To ask you to... What have I done? Is something on your mind? Oh, nothing. No, it's these kids' games. They'd be briefing tests. Yeah. Well, they're not just for amusement. All right, let's forget it, shall we? I've got her in Carol. I'm taking her out this evening. Sure. How is she? She's fine. Ooh. Fine. And it's strange, isn't it? Um, I'm sure I'm not the only person who feels like this. We have a, a guest character this week named Paul. And, of course, Paul Foster would become such an important character on the show just one week later. I don't know why they kept this character's name as Paul, then. So how did Roper make out in the decision stress? It was too early to say for certain, but he seemed... Well, he seemed a bit strung out. You couldn't tell the difference between a herd of cattle and a picture of the Taj Mahal. Any ideas? I'm very concerned. Could be anything. Boredom. Mrs. His wife. <laughs> See you. Well... That's uh, expert uh, psychiatric analysis there from Dr. Schroeder. Now, if Jackson had done it, oh, Jackson would have done it properly. I don't think I can take you out looking like that. What do you mean? Oh, people might say, what's that beautiful young girl doing out with a broken down old wreck? <laughs> well, don't worry. I can always tell them I married you for your money. Yeah, the age difference between the two of them is quite noticeable. I mean, I say that not knowing how old George Cole would have been at this point. Jeff, I'm hungry. But I'm assuming there's at least 10, 15 years between them. Not that there's anything wrong with that. It's just strange that the show would go out of its way to acknowledge it. What do they say? Not good. The stress decision tests are positive. Oh, no. Wait, he was scoring positive all the way through, and that seemed like a good thing. Decision making below par. Reflexes bad. Animal identification weak. He's an out-and-out -out risk, Alec. And we can't afford to take chances. I've Again, this discussion makes the whole test thing seem so weird in the way it's presented. I don't know why. There were literally photos of maps and photos of, like, photographs of pages in a book. Lovely evening, Tom. It doesn't mean anything, that test, and they're like, oh my goodness, this is very serious. But it, I don't know, I wish I could understand that test a bit, just a bit more. Hey, I'm not Cinderella, you know. Don't drive so fast. I don't have to be home by midnight. Oh, but he does. Sorry. Makes you wonder why... Oh, no, I was going to say makes you wonder why he agreed to take her out this night when he knows he's got a call. But he did it because he's a good guy who wants to uh, cheer his wife up after that terrifying intruder incident. Uh-oh. I thought I saw someone. And she did. There was someone in the bushes over there. It's nothing. Well, Again, it's another beautifully bright Come on. Ask um, midnight. Yes, now... I would, forgive me for going a bit Lloyd Grossman, but who lives in a house like this? It's a very nice house. I mean, considering we see later on Paul Foster lives in a pokey little apartment, Straker's house is nice, but it's not big. What's Roper doing to earn so much money to have such a nice house? All right. With a beautiful wife. We may ask ourselves, well, how did he get here? Come on. Ah, He's also wearing a pink shirt now. Now he's doing the whole, there are no monsters in the house, everything's fine. I'll put the car away. Better take that dress off, because the pinkness of it, you'll fade into the pink walls and the pink door and the pink everything. Too much pink. I've not seen that much pink since uh, young Estes in The Witness was in the pinkest hotel, not hotel room, hospital room. Back in Space Precinct, oh dear. So... 
I love that the clock over the garage is also clearly showing midnight, yet there's bright blue sky visible in the trees beyond. It's all right. I know it's it's a common thing in, in shows and films of this era. Okay. And who's this sneaking around in the bushes? Begin. 42 degrees, <gasps> 2 minutes, Ooh. angle 8 four. He's passing on information to the naughty man on the phone. Angle 65. Go down to 68 degrees. So, of course, the man in the bushes is not Dawson, because Dawson is on the other end of the phone. So who does that leave? Holding a tape recorder and a microphone, it's... Now down three. <gasps> Wearing his best shocked face, it's Alec Freeman. And <laughs> another, this is brilliant as an interrogation. You put Roper in a room. Um, again, it looks like Schroeder's office where they did the medical test earlier. Wheel in a television with Straker on it. Don't get Straker in the room, because that would involve Straker getting up from behind his desk. We can't have that. Uh, it's just be, the idea of Straker being on a TV and telling him off. Oh, dear. Well, that didn't work, Alec. Got to make him talk, Alec. Uh, maybe if I went in there? No, no, he'd be expecting that. Money? No. Blackmail? Or threats? Violence? His wife, maybe. Mm, she's pretty violent. Tell me about her. Carol? She's young, attractive. Likes the colour pink. I can understand it if she I understand it. Can't you accept the fact that he's a traitor? I know that. But it's also a matter of degree. Degree, nothing. It's what he's told him that matters, not why. And scenes like this I find I find interesting with early UFO, where we'll see, the setup for the dilemma is, I mean, to be honest, it's fairly weak. And George Sewell, and particularly Ed Bishop, are really giving it, my God, this is so important. It, it couldn't be more important. Also here, he, you don't Straker comes across as quite threatening. And you think by keeping quiet, you'll be able to protect her? Not when I get through with her, you won't. Oh, he's shaking his head. You tell us what we want to know. That's the best way to give her protection. Ha! Ah, now they've called him into Straker's office. Please. Things are getting serious. Yeah, this costume of, of Roy Thinnes's... Two, seven, Again, I think we've seen it on the randomizer before. It was on John Croxley in ESP. They got some use out of it. I have a feeling George Sewell might even have worn it at one point. Numbers. Angles. What do they mean, Roper? I was given program numbers for SID. Told to feed in certain information. Memorize the results. Ah. Strange to hear Sid being spelled out as SID. Give you the data, not the significance. You mean to tell me you didn't know what you were doing when you handed over those figures? No. We're going to have to put everything into finding out. Get me Commander Straker. Yes, Lieutenant. This is where I, I feel... Well, keep working on it, Lieutenant. We may be starting to lose the story in the editing department. Direction indicators. Now, what does that mean? Particularly with the moon base scenes. Of course, only in three dimensions. I, I've seen it mentioned before... Yeah that parts of this episode feel like they're edited together in the wrong order, and I completely... Not much, but... I, I wouldn't say agree with it, but I can see why people would say that. With these these moon base scenes... Flight path. Up to where? So we've now established Roper's information was a flight path. Okay. See what we've got. Some sort of a flight path. And the fact that they chose Roper to do their dirty work. But then, I, I'm, it, it feels like we have that scene where they say... Oh, it's a flight path. Okay, but I feel like later on there's another scene where they, they go, My God, what do these numbers mean? Oh, it's a flight path. We'd better tell Straker. And then it cuts back to Straker going, My goodness, what could those numbers mean? On the other end of that phone. I, I mean, let me know if, if I, I'm alone in this. As I said, I, I know I'm not. Other people have, have mentioned let him go, Alec. that the editing in this episode feels a bit strange. In terms of how, it just in terms of the order of certain scenes. Very neat. You've just let the whole base know we're going to release Roper in an hour. <laughs> how does that work? Yeah, Straker just issued an instruction to Ford, who's in the other in the control room. He's put his key down and held the key down so that uh, everyone would hear that Roper is going to be let out. But why does that mean the whole base is going to know? Is Ford that much of a gossip? Like I, cu I couldn't believe that of him. Let him go, Alec. 
We must draw them out into the open. Okay. And if it means putting his life at risk, I'm all for it. Now one moment, Moonbase. That's actually not <laughs> that's actually not as um um mocking as I thought it would be when I said it, because that's kind of Straker's attitude. And what does she make of them? They describe relative planetary positions. Yeah, this is what I was talking about. The relative position of the sun, moon, and earth would fit Roper's figures. One snag. The last set of information is a time reference, but it still doesn't make sense. Well, you've come up with enough to scare the daylights out of me, Lieutenant. Keep working on that last sequence. Out. So we already knew it was a flight path, and it sounded like it was... They knew everything. And now... Oh, now we're finding out more than we didn't know before i don't know it it just feels the editing here feels kind of strange and now we get this long scene of straker alone in his office with a, a slide rule and a pencil he's been very busy trying to calculate something but they've got the flight path they've got the idea that it's the sun moon and earth i don't know what's going on with some of these scenes the way they are ordered it just feels odd sir you want to know when rover left did i i don't remember reading that in the script but my orders were that he was to be released in one hour's time yes sir but i understand colonel free i see god alec all my problems are caused by Alec Freeman. Yeah, um... Maximum security uh, alert. Why... Get me Captain Carlin on Skydiver. I don't know. Attention! I know Straker did say, let him go in one hour. alert. But, um... Yeah. Oh, I don't know. Condition red. Your instructions have been... This is cool, though. I love this action montage of stock footage and considering this is only the third episode in production order we have quite a bit of stock footage already hanging around We've got some interceptors to launch of course straker's going to tell them what to do this is straker we are faced with a probable ufo attack against an under bah, 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 bah. yeah there's the observatory from now that observatory turned up in close up but is that reused footage from the secret service or is that just part of a reused prop um that control room with the massive um, satellite dish on the front who knows anyway interceptors are go mobiles are go observatories possibly from other series are go and there's skydiver diving and again you, you can just tell by looking at the picture that it's stock footage but i don't think we've seen that shot in the show yet for real until now that operational sir captain carlin standing by right captain carlin straker carlin reading you I want you to launch Sky One for possible interception. Area? Green Zero B. Make a 20 mile radius sweep around Shadow HQ. Sounds pretty close to home, sir. What's going on? Well, that's our problem, Captain. You just concentrate on being ready. Out. Launch stations. Yes, sir. Launch stations. Poor skydiver crew. They never know what's going on. Two. Two here. And I do feel for, for Jeremy Wilkin and Georgina Moon and uh, John Kelly having to make the most of such little screen time in moments like this. Like, Jeremy Walken had a clipboard, and my goodness, nobody wrote on a clipboard more more seriously and genuinely than he did there. Um, yeah, these are good people, and they just get barely a look-in sometimes. Anyway, Sky One is away, and so is the UFO. I don't know, were they listening in on shadow frequencies? Oh no, they've come to get Roper. And this is um, one of my favourite special effects bits from the whole show, I think. Again, another very bright blue sky night. Have relocated UFO in area 427 blue. You can maybe get away with, with unconvincing day for night once. They've done it three times this week. And yet in the model shots, obviously, it's it's graded just right. Leaving you. Suspect driving east on route four in bronze shadow car. Follow and observe. Roger, out. Oh, so it's a specific shadow car. That brand of car is not available to the general public? Interesting. Oh, I love that shot. That model shot of the UFO passing so close over Roper's car. And now he's he's making a run for it, but the UFO's after him. And a very nice integration of model and live action shot there as we see um, Roper's viewpoint as the UFO hits the ground in front of him. And there we go. He's crashed into a petrol station. And needless to say, you know, this is an Anderson show. 
the petrol station explodes with the might of I don't know all the explosions in Thunderbirds combined the whole place is totally on fire anyone who was in there is dead 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 control I'm positioned over target but Roper survived all destroyed and an odd a rare very rare moment of bad acting from Ed Bishop here that hand when he, when he does a face palm and shakes his head coordinates it looks terrible <laughs> I always thought that looks absolutely terrible um, but hey ho yes Roper survived thank goodness with only light scratches oh that's it the universe is minus one UFO Oh, is that little Diddy Shadow Ambulance that I believe still exists? They bring them in now, sir. I'm sure I've seen it at Andicon or, or similar. It might have been um, at, at Fab Worlds or another convention or something. All right, Paul? Yeah, I'm fine. Okay, I'm glad we had this talk. Now, let him continue to bleed internally in another room. Maintain surveillance for Shadow Medic Dawson. Yeah, there's two security guards in, uh... This is a war, Alec. What I believe was later Lake's car. Risk. I don't buy that. And I never will. It's too complicated for people like me. And too simple for people like you. And that's, this is a, a scene that I find is a good example of what I feel doesn't work with early UFO. They're so keen to present serious issues where people can be, you know, at loggerheads, sort of, Oh, no, you're wrong, oh, I'm right. But they, they don't quite take the time to really... Uh, develop a, a situation where moments like that interactions like that would arise naturally in later episodes they do but in early episodes i think the andersons are so keen to to present character conflict that they don't quite did it on purpose um set it up could have cost him his life effectively it could cost him his wife ah we've learned some rhyming words a couple of guards to roper's house wife rhymes with life so, at the Roper home, Carol is fretting, presumably because Paul isn't back yet. Oh, yeah, it's 25 past midnight. She's fretting in the bedroom, because I guess they don't have a front room. She keeps all her magazines in the bedroom. We've just passed the Rapton flyover. Yes, these two security guards. One of them is played by David Dacre, who Doctor Who fans will um, remember from uh, Nightmare of Eden and the Time Warrior. He was, was Iron Gron in The Time Warrior. Very good, very hammy performance in that. Um, it doesn't get much to do here. He's just a very minor shadow security man. Oh. And Carol, with her incredible hearing, has heard the front door handle creak slowly open. Well, she's very nervous because she's Carol Roper and she doesn't like to leave her pink bedroom. I may sound like I don't like the character. I do. She's kind of a wimp. But I, I really like uh, Sonia Fox, actually. And I haven't seen her in much outside of the ITC shows. She would turn up in things occasionally, like like this and Danger Man and so forth. But, yeah, she's very good at um, at playing the, uh, the very timid housewife here. She's got the shotgun out again. Oh! And the shot went straight through the door. Caught Dawson oh in the cheek. That's a fairly fairly messy. I mean it's it is mostly blood. You don't see an injury as such, but and this is where I have to say Carol really does not help herself here. Dawson is down, severely injured, and he's crawling ever so slowly towards his gun. She has so much time to get it off him, but because she's such a wimp, she doesn't. She dead. Well, that's that then. Another Shadow Operative's marriage ends in death. Straker's still fiddling with the whiteboard. ...from flight plan passed to aliens by Roper uh -huh. have been analysed, input information incorrect. Uh -huh. Result negative. We're still on this, are we? What do you make of it, Joan? Nothing. Straker's not going to buy that. Rerun it. It won't alter the result, Lieutenant. Will if you permutate it differently. Oh. If you insist, Lieutenant. You ask a different question, you'll get a different answer. Again, this is what I mean by scenes being in the wrong order. We have that scene there where it suddenly seems like nobody knows what's going on with these figures. And now we're back in Straker's office. He's just standing in front of that um, wonderful mini 
um, I don't know what you'd call it, um, solar system thing in the, the wall of his office. It looks very nice. It's a very cool shot. But it just suddenly seems like uh, everyone's forgotten what they already knew regarding flight plans and so forth. And now it's still in Straker's office, but it must be sometime later. Dawson died ten minutes ago. Oh, no. Yes. Shotgun makes quite a mess. The doctor's found this. Oh, I've been looking for that. It's some sort of electronic probe. It had been inserted into his temple. Well, I think the picture is almost complete. Who am I kidding? No, it's not. I don't have a clue what's going on this week. Come over here, Alec. Watch this. Oh. Yes, we're making... I don't know if this this prop thing, this prop solar system uh, observatory... No, not observatory. But there's, a, there's an obvious word for what this is. And I can't think of it at the moment. But was this installed in Straker's office just for this one story? There. Ah. Sunrise on the moon. Exactly. Mm. That's how they plan to make the attack. The point where the Earth is directly between the sun and the moon. At sunrise, keeping between moon base and the sun. Visually undetectable. But it would be picked up by moon base radar the moment it crossed the horizon. Not if the attack were planned to coincide with heavy sunspot activity. Ooh. Like that predicted in two days' time. Sunspots. Yes, they were an occasional thorn in the side of the moon base personnel. I think Mindbender used that as well. We have Roper's flight plan too, remember? I don't see how we can stop it. One man, on his own, at a predetermined position out on the moon's surface. Rocket launcher, polarized visor. It'd be suicide. But you can't expect a man to... I don't need a volunteer, Alec. I've chosen you. Oh, Roper, yeah. Suppose you use this to twist his arm. Oh, I didn't have to. Photo of Carol's dead body. To try and even the score. And when are you going to tell him? Maybe you'll never need to know. Hmm. Oh, dear. Poor old Carol. Well, she had two... She had the shotgun and Dawson's gun that she could have grabbed. I just... I, I watch that scene and think, come on, woman, do something. Do something. Anything. Hide in the other room. Now, once you're outside, maintain radio silence. One favour. I couldn't tell Carol, my wife. If you could book an earth call, either way, you know what I mean. I'll sort things out when you get back. Oh. I like the, the moon base girls trying to be reassuring here. And speaking of reassurance... Good. Here's Straker. Page one. Oh, Roper. Good luck. I like the way Ed Bishop plays that as just, oh, wishing the guy good luck. This is a very minor part of this. As long as he does the job, I don't really care about the man. Prepare for exit procedure. And this is where one of those deleted scenes that I mentioned at the very beginning of all this actually comes into play again, where um, it's Joan who's helping him out to the airlock with all his gear, because earlier on she'd come to collect him for the flight home and he'd snapped at her. Antonio Ellis is playing this now as kind of a no hard feelings sort of thing. Good luck, Paul. And if you don't come back, I guess we'll have to find another Paul. Better, younger, stronger, more handsome, hairier. Well, this is starting to appeal to me more and more. And this is it. We, yeah, we've come to this point now where we, we have George Cole in a spacesuit. We have Arthur Daly in a spacesuit. It's... I know I said I wouldn't mention Minder again, but it is quite the image. Now to doors. Stand by for exit. And so that's it. Roper is out on the surface, on his own, armed only with a bazooka. Now, where's that UFO? Is there any chance of the radar trackers operating? Not with all this sunspot activity. Now, when I was, um, younger, uh... Many years ago, uh, I had a tape th with this episode on. Because I, I, the first time I'd seen this was when it went out on the BBC. But then a few years later, a company named Digital Entertainment, uh, who also later released the uh, in complete run of uh, Space Precinct on DVD and VHS. First time that had uh, ever been released in its entirety. I think that was the first Anderson DVD ever, actually, the uh, Space Precinct DVDs. But they put out all of UFO on VHS, including the episodes that had uh, had been missed for the compilation. And uh, so I had the first set, the first tape, I should say, in this collection was, of course, Volume Zero. 
which made it very hard to track down in the pre-Amazon days, Volume Zero. But they had the first three episodes of the series on there. Uh, this identified and uh, confetti check. No, not confetti check. Com this identified and computer affair. And it was so obvious to me that the show needs something. <laughs> something more we've got the beginnings of something great here and there's just a key element missing that it, it's not quite coming together yet we need i don't know just Rope is on his own. someone with a bit of spark someone with a bit of you know a, a slight maverick air to them someone who can do the physical stuff and, and generally, also, the show kind of needs to kick up the backside in terms of pacing in these really early episodes. So it's just so great to go from that first tape into the second tape, Volume 1, with uh, Exposed and Survival on. And, and seconds since sun up, Lieutenant. Paul Foster's arrival is just that, that kick that it needed. Um, so with these, these three early episodes, I, I, to be honest, I don't get a huge amount out of them. I can appreciate and enjoy moments um, in all three. I can kind of appreciate what they were trying to do more than what they actually did. Like with the downbeat stuff in this episode. Um, the stuff in the forest in Computer Affair. Not much from Identified, to be honest. But I, I just, I don't know, how do other people feel about the, the, the first three UFO episodes in production order? Identified Computer Affair and uh, Flight Path. I know that on broadcast they were they were never shown in three consecutive uh, episodes like that, I think. Ooh, he hit the UFO. Yeah, I think this was shown as like somewhere in the middle of the run. Where again, it doesn't quite work because the costumes the the wigs if it, it's it, it feels like a very early episode but hey ho so this is great where we have a guy out on the surface just kind of pottering around in total silence for a while i can go quiet for as long as i like until i have something to talk about roper and his bazooka he's gonna bazooka that ufo when it reappears from behind that rock the ufo's hiding at the moment it's being all shy but he's lining up his... Oh, there it is! The UFO's almost playing peekaboo with him. I love that. It, the, the top of the UFO just very slowly peeks out from behind that rock. And then... Hey! That's a direct hit. And... A lovely crash landing. I love that it's sort of spewing very pink fire. Yes. Probably full of some harmful gas that wouldn't be used today. But he's done it. Good old Roper. UFO... Destroyed. He's done it. Get a moon hopper out there fast. Right, we're done. Ah, but remember, this is a one episode character. Losing a little air. And this is UFO. Damage. Only slight. So we have to go for our downbeat ending. He's got a slight puncture in his suit. We don't even see what causes it. He's got his puncture repair kit, which is a little tube of glue. Oh, he's dropped it. Oh dear, he can shoot down a UFO, but he can't handle a tube of glue. Gonna make himself comfier here, try again with the glue. His visor's clouding up, and I do like actually with this, this glue thing. Every time he applies some glue, air bubbles appear in it. It's the glue just isn't setting right. Because we we seem to be skimping on our emergency survival gear in Shadow. Again, it's money going into those coffee machines. Listen, a moon hopper is on its way. It'll be with you in minutes. Fine. See? There it is. And there was a model shot earlier where... Oh, I like that Roper's visor clouds up more and more. There was a model shot earlier that showed Moonbase actually wasn't that far from Roper's position. I hope this evens things up. Obviously it, it isn't because he, he went out on foot. Carol! 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 Oh dear. And hold on the bubble. Paul! This expanding bubble of glue. Roper! He's almost out and he's gone. 
and there goes the glue bubble. And oh yeah, we just hear the moonmobile arriving, just too late to do anything. Probably. There's a chance he survived after that, um, but he's never mentioned again because, as I said, next week we get a new Paul, a better Paul, uh, an all-round more interesting Paul for more interesting stories. So that was Flight Path, and um, I, you know, I, when I had that old Volume Zero tape, I used to find this the weakest episode of the first three. Now I would say that definitely goes to Identified. I do appreciate this one more than I used to, but it's still not anywhere near the heights that the show would would very soon be be aspiring to. And I think they are trying. It's just not quite... Something's missing. And it's a big old hairy guy named Paul Foster. But some nice stuff here with um, with George Cole and uh, and Sonia Fox. Uh, but the, the editing stuff in this, the story just doesn't quite click the way it uh, perhaps should have done. Sorry. Ooh, spooky hey? music for the end of the UFO. <laughs> yes. It's not Scooby-Doo. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Waggy. Oh, I knew that was coming. I no, think. sorry, sorry. Stop me, somebody. It's absolutely fine. Anyway, thank you, Chris. Lovely bit of UFO. Yeah. Who doesn't love yeah. a bit of UFO? We've been talking about UFO quite a lot in this episode. So yes. It's very, very good. Smart. Mm. Nice. Yeah. And of course, he'll be back next week with another random episode from a random Jerry Anderson series we don't know what it'll be because it's completely random we know that we say it every week it's random it's, it's the random it's random yeah. yeah it's random uh, meanwhile over on Twitter Stuart Moyer has said finally got round to watching Jerry Anderson A Life Uncharted on Britbox excellent work and really interesting says Stuart learned quite a bit about the man and what an emotional journey I mean isn't that wonderful that's a great thing Jamie is that it, people are still coming to A Life Uncharted even now aren't they and uh, Oh, it's lovely. of support and uh, interest. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And no, uh, they keep they keep keep coming in thick and fast, and it's brilliant. And people will just continue to find it because that's the nature of streaming these days. Unless you've got a big, mm. you know, multi million pound launch of something, um, yeah, where yeah. everybody kind that's of right. makes it an event. It's much more yeah. of a gradual thing, and that's kind of nice. Yeah, it is nice. Yeah. Uh, since we last spoke, of course, it's been Breakaway Day. Uh, and mm. Becca posted on Breakaway Day, Space 1999 Breakaway remains one of the strongest, most gripping openings in any Anderson show. With its international cast and crew, iconic set design, costumes, effects and score, it's easy to see why it has endured. I'd echo that as well, Becca. I think that's absolutely right. I think it is one of the most strongest opening episodes of all the Jerry Anderson series. Uh, it's big and brave it is. and uh, quite rather an iconic um, episode. Daniel, uh, rather Darren Wheeler, says you can't beat anything by Jerry Anderson. I always wanted to be Joe Knighty as a kid. Man. Gosh, well, he dodged a bullet there. <laughs> uh, Ilderson <laughs> Mann says, I used to get 13 comics a week. My favourite was TV21, which had comic strip stories of most of Jerry Anderson's puppet series. Genius idea. The artwork was superb, with highly talented illustrators like Mike Noble, Ron and Jerry Embleton and Frank Bellamy. Oh, yes. Yes. David Monday says, returning to Moonbase Alpha has renewed my desire for Jerry Anderson TV to launch a theme park complete with themed hotels. And he uh, <laughs> attached some pictures of main mission from Space 1999 saying, just look at that mood lighting. I'd pay to spend a holiday exploring this place. Make it happen, <laughs> Jamie Anderson. Oh, all right. Oh, yeah, wouldn't that be great? I'm going to do it now. Uh, and on a similar theme, Robert Coker says, Lottery fantasy. Build an entire park based on Jerry Anderson properties. Moonbase Alpha, Spectrum Headquarters, the Stingray Marineville Base, Tracy Island. Oh, to dream. Mm. Yeah. Wouldn't that be wonderful? Why has no one ever done that? Oh, there's a, well, a million reasons why not. There we are. I know, it's complicated. <laughs> but uh, yeah, we can dream. It's a wonderful idea. Where would you pick to go first you think out of all of those locations in a jerry anderson theme park oh hmm i mean you head to first that's quite tricky actually yeah i think it would be main mission for me moonbase would alpha it? yeah i think so mm. yeah i would take the ride i think uh to thunderbird 2 via all sure. the launch slides yeah nice yeah lean yeah. back on that well, picture and off we go yeah let's make it happen i've got a few quid behind the back of the sofa i'm sure Oh, right. Um, yeah, that's what it'll take. I'll check my pockets and... Um, yeah. Oh, some moths just flew out there. I'll, uh, <laughs> <laughs> we'll have to do what we can, eh? Yeah. Uh, all for now, but do remember you could tag us on Twitter. Hashtag us Jerry Anderson Podcast. Tag me, Richard N. James. Him over there, I'm Jamie Anderson. And him, just left with his randomizer, Chris Dalek. Oh, gosh. Yeah. Yes, that's it. That's, that's uh, it. That's it. That's it. Are we done? 
Oh, I think we're done for now. Yeah, yeah I'm knackered. More next week, of course. I know you, I know you. More? Oh, yes, we can't stop now. We've got another 224 pods to go. Have we? <laughs> well, I'm only going to do 448. I don't know about you. Oh, OK. Was that the contractual thing? I forgot. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, OK. That's and then luck- we renegotiate. That's your lucky number, isn't it? 448. <laughs> yeah, that's right. I don't know why you chose yeah, that. Very strange. Anyway, yeah. right, that's enough mm. of that nonsense. Yep. Shall we just um, go yes. away? I think we should. Good. Thanks so much for listening, uh, Postrons. We hope your ears are not too clammy after spending all this lovely time with us, and we'll be back in them after you've dried them next week. (laughs) Bye. (laughs) Bye. Stage one complete. Let's go. So when are you going to start writing the one-act play uh, Chris Bentley's Decanter? Well, I think I could get onto it straight away. I think it's a bit of a mystery, isn't it? What is in the decanter? Uh, yeah, absolutely. What exactly is in the decanter? It's a, it's a yeah. clue to some much bigger thing that's going oh, on. Definitely. Uh, it's probably involving a murder. Yes. Uh, a chocolate hobnob. And yes. the A14 road in uh, Cambridgeshire. I was going to say that that road has got a really yeah. bleak vibe to it. I Absolutely. think that's perfect. I can imagine a, a detective in, a, you know, in a, in a car, kind of with the decanter <laughs> on the seat, <laughs> travelling somewhere to solve the mystery. Yes, you've got it. Oh. Right, that's it. That's the idea right there. You're not getting any money for it, man. No, no, no. I, it's fine. I just want to see it happen. Yeah, fair enough. Incredible. Mm. Okay, right, I'll get uh, to it. Chris Bentley's Decanter by Richard James. A one of the more unlikely Jerry Anderson <laughs> spin-offs, I think. <laughs> uh, I think everyone would appreciate it, though. So uh, off you go. Go yeah. and start writing it. All right. Okay, see you on the first night. Good luck. Bye. Break a leg. You have been listening to the Jerry Anderson Podcast. Wasn't it fun? You have been listening to an Anderson Entertainment production.